here. Hope that's cool. Hi. Uh, so thank you for the introductions and uh, full disclosure. I already offered one version of this course using basically the same slideshow as part of uh, just last week around Tu Bishvat, the big, bold Jewish climate festival, um, and had about 40 people, five or so were Adat Shalomers, along with people from all over the country. Um, and that was trial run number one. This is trial run number uh, 2.1, I guess, and then 2.2 .2 will be the follow-up two weeks from now. Trying to do this one in two chunks, hopefully close to one hour each. Um, tonight, a little more focused on overall Musar orientation, not going into the Midot nearly as much, uh, or hardly at all, and really focusing on Midah by Midah, uh, attribute by attribute, where there might be some interesting climate and green applicability for those um, in part two. So that's kind of where we're going. And I'm going to screen share much of this. Got a lot of slides. Some of them are really colorful and some of them are really boring, but, uh, but the, the, the text is hopefully never boring. Uh, and the goal of Musar, of course, is that when we study, we're not just studying the way we would read any book. We are studying, looking for how does it affect me personally? What do I have to learn? What do I have to grapple with? What are my growing edges? in this area. And in that sense, the, the large framework of the parallel between ecology and Musar uh, just feels really obvious because, you know, in, in Judaism, we say, Zushver um, zain ayid, right? It's tough to be a Jew. And the history bears that out. And just this weekend, what we witnessed in outside of Fort Worth, right? Still. So Zushver zain ayid, it's tough to be a Jew. Um, and as Kermit the Frog famously taught his piece of Torah, it ain't easy being green, right? And the parallels are really obvious between those two, because each one requires that you dig deeper. You think you understand what it means to, to be on the path of Torah? No, look again, there's more. You think you understand the, the ecological cost-benefit analysis between paper and plastic? No, there's more to consider that goes into that decision, right? And so it, really a lot of parallels. And that's with normative Judaism, kal v'chomer, as we say, all the more so with Musar. So I'm going to invite you to interrupt liberally. Uh, we're a small group, feel free to, um, to unmute and, and share along the way, but we're gonna get going with a little bit of background on what is uh, Musar and then quickly into some of the places where it actually might speak to the great challenge of our time of climate change. Um, these are just four midot. Some of them are the classic. Some of them are, are just better known Jewish concepts. Uh, they happen to go to music. Uh, so a nice leitmotif to chant just these for starters. Um, can't go wrong with love, mercy, loving kindness, and peace. Good place to start. Ah, <laughs> It'll come up again, get to know it. Musar and climate, Musar and ecology. It's interesting, climate, sometimes you hear that word used outside of ecological circles and um, you can even apply it internally. What is, what is my internal climate, right? Uh, people who don't understand the science of climate change, often the helpful analogy is uh, climate and weather are kind of like mood and personality, right? The weather is the mood, but the personality dictates the likelihood 
of being in a particular mood at a particular time. Ditto with the climate. In that sense, the parallel is perfect because Musar is addressing the personality. It's getting to the root. It's not just changing the momentary action. It's not halakha. It's an orientation to the world. And on background, if you do the work of Musar, you are actually positively affecting your climate. Doesn't mean you still won't have moods that are testy or impatient or angry or whatever the negative midot, the negative characteristics are, but the odds are better. Just like if we can curb our carbon and methane, then the odds for our grandchildren will be better. No guarantees, but better odds. So this is the, the draft more or less that I started with. Um, and again, full disclosure, I'm writing a piece for the Reconstructionist Movement's Evolve website that came out of one that I did before on the Jewish basis for environmentalism uh, on Musar and ecology. And I'm not the best person to write it, but no one else has done it yet. And I'm actually asking David Jaffe, like, please write this. You know this stuff way better than I do. Um, but I, I will fill the void and eventually he and others will, will do better. But part of this is actually workshopping this outline of try to put all this into a 2,500 or so word thought piece. Um, so I look forward to your feedback on what, what works and what doesn't, what feels really uh, useful and important to center and what might not quite be worth, you know, the where, what is it, the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? To, you know, all that explanation for an insight that was only meh. <laughs> so um, really looking forward to your unfettered feedback on what works so that this can eventually uh, become not only a teaching that I repeat here and elsewhere, but um, becomes an article that, that lives out there in the larger Jewish world. So in short, uh, Roman numeral one is tonight and Roman numeral two is two weeks from now. Um, the Musar orientation, after the background and the Midot, a whole bunch of aspects of Musar that, as I like to say, will both goad and guide us. Sometimes we need to be impelled to do more and to reduce that cognitive dissonance between our awareness of the science and the reality and our actions. Um, and sometimes we actually need guidance of how do I do this best or how do I sustain myself as I do this? So very quickly, the, the, the six pieces that I've teased out so far, aside from midah by midah, are the idea of every midah and its opposite, that sometimes we need balance, izun, um, the theory of choice points or nikudot habechira, um, the idea of a heat lamdut orientation to always be learning, always be open to new information about ourselves and about the subject that we're studying. Um, no seba ol, exactly as John said earlier, this key idea of bearing the burden of another. Um, Cheshbon hanefesh, going and digging, doing the inner work. Um, and some really interesting stuff about Yetzer HaTov and Yetzer HaRa, our, our positive and negative or our self-directed and other-directed impulses, as Iris Stone teaches. Um, and then wrap up a little bit with Tikkun Olam and Tikkun Midot and looking at what's out there as resources. That's tonight. Just a little hint, when we get there, uh, in a couple of weeks, part two, we will look at the classic lists of Midot and other lists, and then we'll look at a number of Midot for their sort of uh, their applicability. Some are very obvious, like Emet, right? Client, climate science, we need to embrace Emet, right? Um, and, and a whole bunch of others in that family, and then go deep on three. So if there's a big three just to, to kind of tip the hat in that future direction, I would say they are achrayut, um, which is uh, responsibility, um, anava, which is humility, and kavod, which is extending honor um, in all 
appropriate directions. And then a little wrap up with tikva, which in some Musar systems is a midah, in others it isn't. But we certainly need hope as part of this conversation. So that is the broad orientation. And since I can see most of, most of you without stopping the screen share, um, let me just see any comments, questions, reflections so far. That's a lot to uh, absorb in a uh, screen share. I can only imagine what uh, Sarah and Linda are experiencing and looking at this. It's uh, and that, that's a great deal right there. I mean, it's a great deal to absorb. In I'm just assuming that's your roadmap and you're gonna dive into these in more detail momentarily, right? Oh no, that's the session, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then yes, John is correct, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's the roadmap. It's the outline, literally the outline for an essay, but also the outline for this PowerPoint, which is for this, this two-part shiur. Um, and I'm inviting your, in, your feedback on the architecture of it. Does it hang together logically? Um, and of these, which are the key points and which are the ones that maybe don't need to be um, in there, at least as fully as they are here? That's the invitation as we proceed. Huh? Any other reflections, questions? All right. I'm, I'm with you, Rabbi. So far, so good. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Reb Yisrael Salanter um, uh, was in the early to mid 1800s, 19th century. And he is considered, as you may all know, the founder of the Musar movement. The Musar movement institutionalized and made schools out of this inward focus, which drew on already 800 years of Musar literature, going back to Bahi Ibn Pakuda's Chovot HaLevavot, Duties of the Heart, um, just after the year 1000, and all kinds of great writings along the way forward. And those, of course, were all drawing on Bible and on Talmud, so every layer builds upon itself. So insights from Tanakh and from the rabbinic period that then get pulled out by the medievals in a set of random uh, wisdom literatures, and then in the early modern period become a school. And only in the last few decades have, with the survivors from the Shoah of the descendants of the uh, the mostly northern and central European yeshivot, where this stuff was studied so heavily, um, they were horrifically uh, touched, wiped out by the Shoah, but the survivors rebuilt in uh, Israel and here, and only in recent decades has it really sort of seeped out into the non-Orthodox, non-yeshiva world as, wow, this is really core. And more and more of us are discovering, like, where was this all my Jewish life, right? I didn't study Musar in seminary, and I, was, I finished only 25 years ago. Interestingly, five years after I left, Ira Stone started to teach at RRC, right? So it's really, we're just on that cusp. And now um, you can't go five feet in the modern, certainly progressive Jewish world without encountering Musar. But um, you know, where, like I say, where were you all my Jewish life? So Salanter boils it all down to, this is Torah, right? This is Torah, no less than putting the extra time into extra pages of Talmud every day in your Lithuanian yeshiva. But really, we have to remember the Torah came to create a mensch. The Torah didn't come just revelation for revelation's sake. It's revelation for the sake of menschlichkeit. And that was the, that, that's the turn, right? And that changed everything within that world. So all kinds of images, we'll get back to Ben Franklin a little later. Um, most of you already know where that's going, but it's, it's always fun, right? Here's an example, one of my junior colleagues, Marley Weiner from uh, RRC, uh, long after me, she just graduated four years ago, um, 
Musar is the Jewish idea we should take our moral development as seriously and rigorously as our intellectual development. Be constantly awake to the needs of others and striving to meet those needs at all times while taking care of ourselves. And that has revolutionized everything for her. And I would use exactly the same sentence, revolutionize the way I pursue my rabbinate and the way I pursue relationships in the rest of my life. Greg Marcus behind American Musar wrote the article on myjewishlearning.com about this. And he starts with the classic conundrum, why is it hard to be good? Um, Torah tells us what's up, why is it so hard? And the answer is, well, there is no easy answer, but Musar says, that's the right question and let's spend our energy pursuing it. A Jewish spiritual practice that gives concrete instructions on how to live a meaningful and ethical life. And contra to halakha and normative Judaism, which is rule-based, this is virtue-based ethics. And philosophically, in, in, in the study of ethics, that's a very different orientation. It opens the door for personal transformation through a Jewish lens. The word itself, literally that which is passed down, much like Kabbalah, right? Kabbalah we think of as mysticism, it's actually that which is received, and Musar is that which is transmitted. It is passed down insight. It is often translated as rebuke, or more positively, advice. It is often framed as discipline, both to dis if you had to translate it in one word, many people choose discipline and also to acknowledge that that's what it takes to succeed at Musar is you have to bring discipline to your Musar discipline. It's Torah, it's practice, it's moral conduct, instruction, it's all of the above. And here's lots of other takes on what it might be. Um, Elia Lopian, one of the intermediate Ba'ale Musar, Musar masters, either side of the war, teaching the heart what the mind already understands. Shrink that two foot gap between these ventricles and this prefrontal cortex, right? Teach the heart what the mind already grokks, already absorbs. And many of you know Alan Marinus from the Musar Institute, one of the great popularizers. He calls them the midot, the soul traits and reminds us that they can be set at any level and through introspection and self-examination, we figure out which traits are hindrances and we create a curriculum, a soul curriculum for our personal transformative work. So the goal is not to become someone else. It's not to become Zeusia, right? It's not to take on preordained characteristics. It's simply to become the most refined, perfected, elevated version of the unique person you already are. That is what is Musar. Uh, now, there's no definitive statement, and it's fascinating how many definitions there are of just this one word and concept. Um, again, unmute, especially those who have dabbled and even have taught. Um, how does that square with how you introduce what is Musar? Anything missing? Anything weird here? I, I like bringing it back, what you just did and bringing it back to Marinus, the finding the the balance point and that that can change over time. And one of the things I think anybody who's done any kind of self-development is that we get frustrated when we say, oh my goodness, cursing in the car again, you know, mad at my husband over this stupid thing again. Um, but it's, 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 um, it's, it's just that the level, it, the same things come up, but the level changes. Um, and I think by having that lens that we're always finding the balance point, it keeps us from getting um, frustrated and gives the energy to keep going. Nice. Thank you. The thing that uh, I recall is, uh, Maybe this is a strategy for learning, but um, working uh, on a sort of self-truth statement, a ner tamid, and and trying to relate 
uh, the midot, the virtues uh, to the personal mission statement, the Nair Tamid is a way of sort of simplifying in the beginning what we're trying to do and does it, are our decisions, do my decisions match up and mesh with the uh, sort of truth that I try to speak for myself, which evolves. That that may be strategic as a third. I don't know if it's helpful or not. I think it is. Um, John is pointing us toward the idea of writing and journaling and essaying uh, as a key approach because you actually want to hold your insights from one day to the next, one week to the next, one cycle of the midot to the next. Um, on the screen on the right, you see the idea of key phrase. That's another piece. All right, we're not actually here to talk about the mechanics of Musar. We'll be doing more of that. And if all goes well, Martha will actually be teaching that through Adat Shalom and Center for Contemporary Musar simultaneously in the spring. Uh, and we have hopefully big plans for the future of Musar in the life of Adat Shalom. So we'll have other times to talk about what it is and how it works. This is just meant to be a little introduction with the reminder that so much of it does come down to these attributes, these midot. And one way of translating that is virtues. Um, some of you know um, uh, Dave and Dara Feldman in our synagogue, who actually became inheritors of Linda Popov's virtues project, which is Baha'i oriented, right? So every faith tradition has virtues. And their effort, the, the Virtues Project with cards and interpretations, you look at this list, which comes out of Baha'i tradition and secular American, and you see, right, diligence, enthusiasm, forgiveness, generosity, honesty, honor, humility, right? This, this is Musar. So what's interesting is how Musar simultaneously is and isn't uniquely Jewish. It is very particular because it's rooted in Torah. It is very particularly religious because so many of these particularly fear and awe and trust and, and belief, right, come down to a theological angle. And yet here we see just how universal they are. That's a leitmotif here because of course ecology is universal even as it affects us in very particular ways. So right? If the weather gets weird in Bangladesh, we're all in trouble, but we may not feel it right away. If the weather gets weird in Bethesda, then that's another story, right? And uh, ultimately, Bethesda and Bangladesh are very closely connected, but that's almost a Musar insight, a Torah insight to get to the place of acknowledging that, and in part, we'll get there. So, um, it all connects, and that's the ride that we're on. So uh, fasten your seatbelts. Um, Can I? Carrie, go ahead. Well, I just, uh, it struck me as you were talking, be even before phrase virtue et ethics came up. I mean, this is big in bioethics, Aristotelian, the, the, the virtuous actor, and it's applied to clinicians. And so I'm, I'm making those comparisons and noting and doing a little bit of a comparison here on this chart that I have. So I'm gonna go down that rabbit hole. After this session, I'm gonna really try to stay focused on the, 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 the Musar based uh, origins, but uh, it's really interesting. There's more of a hook here for me than I had appreciated. Yeah. I look forward to exploring that with you. I was uh, just this morning with one of my teachers, Rabbi David Teutsch, who's one of the leading Jewish bioethicists, um, uh, talking about familiar. some of the, these issues. Um, and there's a lot of overlap, right? The uh, the recent head of the uh, Society of Jewish Ethics um, at uh, University of Chicago. Um, um, uh, why am I spacing? She's amazing. Anyway, uh, like also like you know, leading bioethicist who's really big on Levinas and Emmanuel Levinas is of course the angle that Ira Stone, who brought Musar to many of our attention, really filters Musar through a Levinasian philosophical lens of of ethics. And anyway, that's another rabbit hole. It's worth going down, but not now. Uh, so just flag like. Uh, that whole matrix of Torah. It's all good stuff. Um, 
Foundation for Jewish Camp, interestingly, has figured out that this is good stuff for kids. And Jewish summer camps all over, including the Reconstructionist Havaya, have versions of this and study Midot. Um, there's other angles on the periodic table model. What are your strengths? What do you want to develop? Right? Where, where are you already strong and you can play to that? And where are your growing edges that you should really be pushing? Um, so again, um, before we get into any of these particular Midot, here's the frameworks to goad and aid us. I already introduced the six. So unless there are further reflections or arguments at this point, we proceed. All right, every mida and its opposite. So for example, nichuta uh, or menuchat nefesh, equanimity or calmness is usually thought of as the positive mida. Against it is kaos or anger, which is usually thought of as the negative mida. And yet, every mida and its opposite. There is a time for anger. I am angry at Exxon for having known since the 1980s that climate change was going to reach tipping points and purposefully obfuscating that. If I have too much equanimity too early around that, then I am no longer in ethical balance. And if I am only consumed with anger at what was done 35 years ago, I won't get anywhere. Every mida and its opposite. Can we find the sweet spot between even those that seem overwhelmingly positive, but on examination need balance, and even those negative traits, which once in a while do need to come out. So that is, of course, the word midah originally, uh, and modern Hebrew speakers who have never met Musar are really freaked out by it because it's a very common word to mean measure, right? Like it comes up in fourth grade science class, right? How much of this thing? It's like mass and volume, right? Midah, it's a measurement. And like, what are you talking about measurements as if that's like an ethical system? No, right? Well, yes, because the key here is ratio. The key here is how much of which when. It's applied ethics of virtues. So, um, so this is the, uh, Salanter himself came up with this phrase, kol midava hipucho every midah and its hefach and its opposite. Um, and framed Jewishly, right, as I, or, or ecologically, as I say here at the bottom, that there are certain moral imperatives we can't compromise on, and there's clearly no compromising with atmospheric chemistry or the laws of physics. So there are, there are certain inviolate principles where compromise is not appropriate, and yet both for our ethical orientation in the world, our relationships, and even for the best communication as a strategy to yield the best odds of positive results of moving others, we need to approach everything through civil conversation. We need to be able to acknowledge where other people are at. And so even if we have mastered the mida and have put ourselves in the right balance, we still need to understand where people are coming from differently. Um, framed in a deeper way, that's pluralism, right? Which gets to humility, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've done all this Musar work to get to this sweet spot and I think I've finally found balance, but if I'm really humble, I realize there's always more information that I haven't yet absorbed that would actually force me to go back to the drawing board. So Izun, balance, when you think about balance, it's you know like the old scales of justice, like on the Supreme Court with the blindfold, right? Because justice is blind. Um, that, um, right? I mean, really, how often are they exactly the same, right? Down to the, down to what? Down to the gram, down to the tenth of a gram, down to the microgram, the nanogram, right? How far do you go? What is balance? Anyway, um, that's going deeper than we need to, but. John, please. Is it fair to ask a question? The Musar approach to 
balancing uh, a sense of, in my case, it's not anger. In, in some ways, it's anger. But climate change deniers, there's this inherent, uh, I have a, I'm not sure anger is the right word, but the Musar approach, what, what's the balance to, uh, to try to bear uh, deniers and, can you speak to that for a second? Uh, I wish I could. Um, <laughs> um, it, when I get to hope at the end of the second session, there's stuff there that, that speaks a little bit to this. Um, and really the hope is that there are ever fewer deniers, um, right? Uh, because we've reached some great tipping points where the majority of America is either alarmed or concerned um, and the number that are really denying is 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 lower than it's ever been. Um, it's not zero, and of course, it's being fed. We can, you know, look no further than the electoral process around us this year to say what happens when people in leadership peddle misinformation, and then the street buys it. So I'm. That's why I started my anger not at random deniers today, but going upstream to Exxon, to Peabody Coal, to, right, the, you know, to the folks who, who knew early on and obfuscated, and then others are naturally going to follow the Yetzer Hara. If you've got, if you believe that your job or your way of life or your town is on the line, you are going to find the information that meets your, um, you know, your previous orientation. And so, um, uh, that's why I'm saying there's no compromise with absolute lack of emmet, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's no compromise with pure out falsehood. Um, but there needs to at least be understanding and empathy with those who have been peddled falsehoods and have absorbed them. So that, that's a very partial and inadequate answer. Anyone else have wisdom on this one? Well, I don't know if it's wisdom. I, I I mean, I really like where you're going with this because one of my big concerns when I first got into the stone version of Musar is, is the confusion between bearing the burden of the other and enabling certain behaviors. And what I'm hoping to learn from this is kind of what's, What's deeper? What's the real, um, what's underneath that burden? Because then, then we can take the correct action that's like, will really change things. That's the real burden. It's kind of like, um, you know, if somebody is thinking that Trump won the election and then da 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 da, -da and then you realize that person, you know, is, is, they lost their job to, you know, outsourcing. So the real bearing the burden is, is creating a more just society, not like going, oh, you poor thing, you know, you. Nice, here, here. And that dance between the interpersonal and the structural of I can, in relationship, I can bear your burden, but how are we as a society bearing the burdens of 7.9 billion people on this planet, right? The, that's a different question than am I going to be nice to you, <laughs> right? Um, and there are plenty of people who are very nice to everyone they encounter, but don't think systemically and unwittingly are contributing to devastation for people outside of their line of sight. Um, and so we need to be thinking about both, and that'll be yet another leitmotif, and wow, have we raised a lot of questions before we've even gotten to any slides. Uh, so, right. um, um, Thank but you I'm with all. Martha. That's not hmm? right with where you're thinking, Martha. Yeah. No, this the, the, this is rich. All right. So that's every me on its opposite. That's the first of the six in uh, big points tonight. Second, bechira point. Nikudat bechira. This comes from Rav Dessler, survivor of the war, lived until 1953, I believe, and was really one of the great bridges from pre to post war. Um, Mostar. Um, um, he's really philosophical. He's addressing the question of free will. 
And he writes in a whole section on free will at the opening volume of his magisterial Mikhtab Eliyahu that really free will is exaggerated because the vast majority of it is so conditioned by habit or by society that there is effectively no such thing except for a very narrow range of choice points. Anything beyond or before that is outside of our realm because of habit, because of conditioning, we're mostly robots. And the analogy he uses is the battlefront. So if you were in the rough winter of 1916, 1917 um, on Northeastern France, and you saw the birth of this horror of trench warfare, right? You would realize that if you are, you know, put it from the perspective of the allies, you don't want to station all your troops in Paris because the enemy is nowhere near Paris. You also can't even begin to think about already getting to Cologne or Berlin over further to the right because your forces are nowhere near there. You are focused on the few yards in front of you where the battle is. The battle lines are being drawn. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. <laughs> Young people speak in their minds, getting so much resistance from behind. Sorry. Okay. Um, right. But, um, uh, but hey, what's that sound? Everybody, look what's going, Rat. Right? My, 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 my gosh, Rab, I, I, I didn't think you were as old as me. Come on. <laughs> That's before your time. <laughs> I, I was born about when the Buffalo Springfield split up, but uh, but you okay. know, some some pieces of culture are enduring, um, right? But Indeed. the battle line is the is the key, right? And so this is the analogy: put your energy only at the front line. Uh, if I do a good enough job today, I might be able to advance two hundred yards, and if I'm somehow managed to advance 200 yards every day, a year later, I will actually have gone the distance of three towns, right? And a decade later, I will finally have crossed that international border, right? It's slow, it, you need patience. And once in a while, there's a huge breakthrough, just as in real battles. But the idea of focusing where we have the choice. So I am not going to simply shoplift, right? Because that's not my, you know, that's like outside of my choice point because I'm sufficiently raised in honesty and have sufficient means that I don't need to. It would never even occur to me, right? But if I really do an analysis of reparations and I think how much has my white skin privilege allowed my you know, the, the equity in my house to accumulate in a way that was not available to most of my friends of color, then how much of that that I think of as part of a life savings is actually theft, right? Maybe there's choice point there. Others are nowhere near that, right? For some people, the question is not, will I shoplift, but will I, will I shoot <laughs> if I'm caught, right? The Bechira point is different for everyone, depending on where they are. Focus on where you can make a real difference. We're in it, David Jaffe writes, when we sense a struggle between what we know is right and what we feel we want to do. Again, the head and the heart. And once we realize head and heart are misaligned, now we're within the realm of choice. But if head and heart are already both united, either that that's a no-brainer, I'll be ethical, or that's a no-brainer, I just, I'm nowhere near that level, right? Then it's almost don't bother. With that framework, we might just be able to concentrate, I hate all these uh, martial analogies, but right, concentrate our fire on the place that can do the most good for each person at the right time, which is to say, be as effective as possible and moving the needle as fast and as far as possible. Because Bechira point reminds us that a lot of things are not possible. So what we uh, studied 
the concept was to start with your closest other and then to expand outwards to ultimately the infinite other, but to start where you can make the most difference, which is the closest. Yes, yes. Um, so I, Ira Stone's version of Musar emphasizes the closest other, which seems to come out of the Slobodka school, I believe. Um, I, I haven't fully tracked it down. Uh, most others don't focus there, but it's, it's a beautiful and holy and, and appropriate direction. And if you can't get it right with one person who you know the best, like a, like a spouse or a child or a parent, right? Then, um, you know, how are you possibly gonna do right by Bangladesh, <laughs> right? Um, so, but yes, yeah, start, start local and spread, absolutely. So the key here, of course, is that the Bechira point is fluid. The more we choose right, the easier it gets to keep choosing right. And new good habits, we move more of our behavior within the realm of positive habituation. And this, says Dessler, Rav Jaffe explains, this movement is spiritual growth. It is ethical growth. In the green application, it is sustainable growth, but it is spiritual growth. And the classic text on this from uh, Pirkei Avot, mitzvah goreret mitzvah, doing one good deed, one, doing one commandment, doing one thing right, is going to naturally lead you to do another. This is really just the, the laws of inertia, right? An object in motion tends to stay in motion in that direction at that speed, barring other influences. So you get going in a mitzvah direction, you're gonna keep going unless or until you hit a new hindrance. Flip side, equally, avera, gorerit avera. If you decide, no, I'm gonna lower my defenses. This is, it's not so important. I don't need to care about my carbon footprint, right? I don't need to care about the other. I don't have to bear anybody's burden, right? Then you're gonna keep sliding in that direction. And that is the point of habit, the psychological wisdom of this passage of, of, of uh, Talmud from Yoma 86b, Amar Rav Huna, and Rav Huna is like a fourth century um, Amora, Kevan var Adam Avera Veshina. When an Adam, a person, commits an Avera, a, a crime, a, a sin, Veshina, and repeats it, Ba hutralo, it comes to be as if permissible. Like once you have committed, once you're in habitual sin in a direction, you don't even realize it's a sin. And think about that relative to our thermostats, relative to our internal combustion engines, relative to our air travel, relative to any of the areas where we are living out of alignment with what we know to be the values, which point to sustainability and justice and interdependence. So we move over time the choice point. To do that, we need to be self-aware. And that's number three, heat lamdut. It's the reflexive of lomed, right? Lomed is to learn, lil mode is to teach, to cause another to learn. So much richness in this three-letter shoresh of Lamed Mem Dalad, right? But Hit Lam Dut is a stance of always learning. It's a stance of continual openness. And this is Rav Bolby, who just died less than 20 years ago. I'm now studying with uh, Avi Fertig at the Musar Institute, who learned under Shlomo Bolby, and he's my age. Right, like, uh, but but when he was a young yeshiva bacher, he studied under Volby, and like, and Volby was a fourth generation from Salanter, right? So I'm like, it's kind of cool. You, people like him and Micha Berger and some of these others who are out there, and David Jaffe himself, who studied in in um, some Musar yeshivot. Um, um, you know, we get to learn with the people who learned the really direct line. It's kind of cool. Um, and Volby says the mit lamed or mit lamedet, the person who is trying to practice this hit lamdut stance of always learning, 
adopts this stance of a learner, constantly asking, what's happening? How can I learn from this? How does this relate? And that we might actually rise to the spiritual opportunity of a moment by observing. We need to be open. That's Rabbi Amy Eilberg droshing on the concept of, um, of Heat Lamdut. It ties in with anava, with humility, because there's no place for arrogance in it, right? I, if I do right, I shouldn't be too proud. I'm only being a meat lamed, right? Um, and when I'm practicing, I realize, oh, I could have done that better. And um, there'll be a recurring theme here of eco hubris, because on the green application, it's very easy for us greenies to get all self righteous. And that needs to be avoided too. And he lamdut helps put us in our place. Lots of great key elements. The key, uh, keyest of all, lifelong learning and growth mindset. So that's Heat Lamdu. Bearing the burden, no seb ol zulato, literally bearing the yoke of the other. Think of it like a yoke of an ox. It means that the, the ox is pulling that full weight. That's the image of ol, of, of, a, of a, a, a neck uh, yoke, right? Um, and it's also described as no seb ol im chavero. That's um, that's the language used by, in the Nefesh HaChaim, I don't think I put the, the name in. I think that this was actually Rob Volby's teacher, um, who was uh, another important interwar person, um, uh, Rev Yerucham Levavitz. Um, I have to double check that. Did, um, does that ring a bell for Hitlam or for Noseba all here? I mean, it, originally it goes back to, um, Simcha Zissel? Anyway. It, hmm? Well, I, I just know that Ira Stone is teaching a whole course on this, and I did one chunk of it. I don't know. I I I could minimize you and look. Right. I, I, I'm going to say not to worry about it, because what's so interesting is is the, the town of Volozhin, which had one of those great Yitvak, Litvak Yeshivot, was one that was not Musar, it was kind of anti-Musar in the opening years of Salantar, and then it turned. Um, Mir is another that was, it's now the largest yeshiva in the world. It has a, it has a real uh, Musar pedigree, but it only acquired it partway through, right? As opposed to the, the famous big three of Slobodka, Kelm, and Navardak. That's not important here, it's interesting history. But the point is, Volozhin isn't always Musar Torah. And yet here, the, the senior Volozhin had taught the junior Volozhin with rebuke, right? And I love this, this, this uh, piece of Torah when um, uh, Rav Yitzchak of Volozhin says, my father, Rev Chaim of Volozhin, regularly rebuked me. Haya ragil lehochiachoti. He was habitually giving me tochacha, giving me rebuke, al mishtatef, because he saw that I was insufficiently engaging myself, but sa'ara de achrina, in the tsa'ar, the pain of the acher, of the other. I was not invested enough in the pain of others. And these were his constant words to me, this is what it means to be human. You're not created for yourself. You're created to benefit others with the full extent of your powers. Applicability for green Torah, hopefully pretty obvious. <laughs> this is about helping others, human and non-human, present and future, but it's about helping others. If it was to benefit ourselves, then all of our comfort and all of our convenience and all of our preferences could be met and we could continue to burn all the carbon that we wanted to. But if we are created to benefit others with the full extent of our powers, we need to begin to calculate our carbon footprint and shrink it. A little this year, a little more next year, a lot more the year after that and so forth.
Ah, yes. Here's here's Yerucham Lavavet. Sorry, who was Shlomo Volbi's teacher, um, right? Uh, who who uses the language of Noseb Beol Im Chavero, which is either um, uh, lifting up the all the burden with your fellow or lifting up the burden of your fellow. And it's really interesting how those are different and yet, of course, related. Um, commenting on Ecclesiastes, one who is connected to all life has something to trust in. Yesh bitachon. So Rev. Yerucham Lavavitz writes, the issue of bearing the yoke with others of Noseb ol im chavero is so great because this is the whole Torah. It's all about the joining of souls to feel each other's feelings. All Torah study, all learning, all deeds, the goal, souls should be joined, feel each other's feelings, be one. Sounds mystical. Rav Cook could say this, Kabbalists could say this, but there's, as David Jaffe and others have taught, Kabbalah and Musar aren't all that far apart in many places, but um, incredibly powerful. Bearing the yoke with others is the entire Torah. It's good stuff. Now, who is most affected? Who are the others who most need our help? Who are those who are consistently, structurally disempowered, underempowered, underrepresented, ignored? Obviously, poor people, BIPOC, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, etc. And right here's the the literally the front line faces with the banner, climate change affects us the most. We are all vulnerable, but some are more vulnerable than others because of histories and structures that we continue to participate in. So we have to bear the burden of the other. We have to especially bear the burden of the structurally disadvantaged other. And that is environmental justice. That is sophisticated climate activism that actually centers those voices and follows their leadership. And slowly, a lot of us in the historically white, effete environmental movement have been coming to embrace that. It's taken a while. We're still working on it. All right. Ah, home stretch almost. Cheshbon Hanefesh. That, of course, is literally soul accounting. Alan Marinus describes this. This was an article in Reform Judaism. It was a really good intro to Musar for people who don't know it. Look up Alan Marinus, Reform Judaism, High Holy Days, Cheshbon HaNefesh, this, this slide, um, right? That our introspection at this season, High Holy Days, can have great spiritual impact. But for that to happen, we need an inner gaze that is deep and honest. And that's where Cheshbon HaNefesh comes in. It's any stock taking, but this is a year round way to do it systematically, thoroughly, and very effectively. Providing clear knowledge of the forces and contours of your own inner landscape. And as many of you know, that this was laid out in a book, bottom paragraph called Cheshbon HaNefesh, by Menachem Mendel Lefin, or Levin, published in Lvov. It was then called Lemberg, um, now Ukraine. It was then Poland um, in 1812, but it, it was actually written in 1808. Um, and it is a self-help manual, and it is step by step. And Salanter really borrowed heavily from Menachem Mendel Lefin and Cheshbon HaNefesh. And that is remarkable. Because where did Menachem Mendel Lefin of Santanov get his idea of 13 attributes, a specific 13, and that you should review them and then keep going? Well, interestingly, 13 attributes is actually Exodus chapter 34. Adonai, Adonai, el Rachum, Bechanun, right? That's, that's the 13 attributes of God. Franklin knew his Bible. And Ben Franklin knew that 13 attributes was already a thing. Because this nice non-Jewish boy in Philly had read <laughs> Torah. He then wrote his, his autobiography, 
about a process of trying to move toward perfection of virtues of characters by taking a list of 13 attributes, including humility and diligence and modesty, right, et cetera, and focusing on them and repeating. And Menachem Mendel of Santanov read Ben Franklin and copied his list almost verbatim, made two changes, and then put an additional five at the end of, of uh, Cheshbon Nefesh, which include the other two that he had dropped. And then along comes Salanter, a generation later, picks up Menachem Mendel's book. Salanter is true orthodox, whereas Menachem Mendel Leffen was an early maskil of the Haskalah, the Enlightenment. If he were alive a generation later, he would have been among the founders of conservative or reform Judaism based on his writings. It hadn't gelled yet to the point of being something else, but he was suspect, he was too liberal for the Orthodox establishment. And yet Salanter put his imprimatur on the book, reprinted it, changed a couple more of the midot and made that the basis of his whole system. So I put the words two civilizations in there because that's Mordechai Kaplan, the idea of this intentional dance between the best of Judaism and the best of Americanism. And there's maybe no better example than how we got to Salanter's list of, of uh, 13 Midot via Menachem Mendel Leffen, via Ben Franklin, via Exodus 34. Love it, love it, love it. All right. Cheshbona Nefesh, this whole orientation, high holy days, think about right? So there's all these great modern liturgies out there of like for the sin, right? Here, for the wrong of filling land and ocean with filth, toxins, and garbage, for the sin of extinguishing forever wondrous species, which you saved from the waters of the flood. Just examples of modern liturgies that bring home the power of the high holy day sensibility to get us in that vulnerable time and place and help us bring our actions more into alignment. So all the high holy stuff is connected to Musar. But really I wanted to talk about the Simpsons. Uh, so Menachem Mendel's book is the first since Luzado in 1740 in Amsterdam to focus so much on the Yetzer, the impulse, the Yetzer Hara, the evil impulse, and the Yetzer Hatov, the good impulse. And this is how it's usually pictured, right? The devil on one shoulder, the angel on the other shoulder. I particularly like the Matt Groening version because they're both Homer. The devil is Homer, the angel is Homer. And He's got that look on his face like, oh, Marge, what am I going to do? Right. So um, this is us more often than we would care to admit. It's a simplified version, but it's not so far from the truth. And as the Cheshbon Nefesh, Menachem Mendel teaches, Musar without counsel doesn't do it. You can't expect your animal spirit, your lower levels, your... your um, your, your amygdala, right? Um, your id, i.e. your yetzer hara, to be consistently willing to obey the advice of the higher realm, the yetzer hatov, even though the yetzer hatov is giving advice that is, quoting Bible, as clear as the sun at noon. I know what the truth is, but I'm not yet living it. And that, of course, is where Musar comes in. So to understand Yetzer, you have to back up to an underappreciated verse from the end of Genesis chapter one. This is the moment after humans are created, before the first Sabbath. And most people think that if you're summarizing the Bible creation story, God said, good, 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 good every day until people came along and God said, very good. But look again. People are created and blessed by God in verses 26 and 27. Verses 20, I'm sorry, 26 through 28. Verses 29 and 30 prescribe a vegetarian diet. And then verse 31 is the bridge. 
concluding six days of creation, Vayar Elohim et kol asher asa. And God looked at all that God had created, vihine tov ma'od. The interconnected whole is very good. Humans alone, meh. We don't even merit a tov, a good. It's the interconnected whole, kol asher asa. Here's where we get that idea of tov ma'od. And that becomes the classic teaching in Breshit Rabbah, a very early medieval commentary on a Midrash on Genesis. So behold, it was very good. What does that symbolize? Well, of course, the Yetzer HaTov, because that's very good. And Hine Tov Ma'od, behold, it's very good. What else does it symbolize? The Yetzer Hara. Huh. So that the Yetzer Hara is very good surprises me, writes the author. But here's what it means. Ela, rather, without the Yetzer Hara, no one would build a house. No one would get married. No one would have kids. No one would engage in commerce and hard work and research and build things up. And that's where Solomon, back to Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, was right, that all toil, all skilled work comes from rivalry. You need to channel your negative, your competitive, your yetzer hara, or else nothing good is going to happen. Because we are, remember Homer, we are both. We got to put both to work. So um, this is Ira talking about it. Uh, he teaches, he's, he's where I learned the idea of um, the Yetzer Hara being the self-directed inclination. Selfish, but also self-protective, right? That's, that's good. Selfish is bad. Yetzer hara is both. It's anything about myself. Some of it's necessary. Too much of it is evil. And the Yetzer Hatov is the other directed impulse. And that first, uh, right, we can do kibush hayetzer, suppress it if we can. Maybe better is tikkun hayetzer to transform it. So I started thinking about this stuff, as you can see, a long time ago. This is 19 years ago. Bill McKibben wrote about the first generation Priuses. I love this, right? If you thought about global warming all the time, you'd be nuts. When I'm behind the wheel, I'm an American, competitive, scorekeeping, out to win. Can I beat my previous personal best, right? And there's research that actually shows, right? The minute you start measuring mileage, you start caring about it. You can't help yourself. And here, Jim Moto Valley in 2008, citing the research test show, drivers watch the gauge. And by smoothing out acceleration and braking, use 10% less gas. We've known this for 15 years already. And there's a psychological insight here. Even with the best of intentions, people won't largely adjust their habits to fight climate change unless benefits are visible. Same in architecture. A lead architect talking about the need for the score sheet of the leadership in environment, environment and energy design. Um, like on all these things, you get a point for bike racks, you get a point for rooftop solar, you get a point for passive solar orientation, right? Like, and yes, you're out to win. I thought we were only going to be silver, but damn it, we can do gold. Or I thought we were gold, but damn it, we can do platinum. And we need that. So, in the home stretch, are there other ways we can harness the Yetzer Hara for just and green and sustainable ends? And I ask that as we hit basically the conclusion of these green resources that right elements of Musar thought and practice to goad and guide us. So what else should be on that list? There's only a little more. If we have time, we'll get there. But um, thoughts so far? Is there an answer to your question, how the, uh, the rock can help us in our uh, environmental concerns? What would be an example of an answer that you would give? Um, good question. I, 
I gave the the examples of driving and and architectural design. Um, oh yeah, I, I should I should push myself to to answer the question like what else haven't I thought of yet? I'm asking you what haven't you thought of yet? Um, but I mean, does this resonate that we need to harness our our self directed and even selfish impulses toward green and sustainable ends? Mm -hmm. I sort of have a lack of creativity, but I'm thinking along the same lines, the psychology of charging people five cents or rewarding them five cents for use of plastic, uh, use of their own bags versus plastic bags or the, the tax bonus for buying the hybrid car that you've already used as your example. But that, those are just sort of in that same line. I'm trying to think out of that box and I'm lacking a little creativity. No, I mean, who was it who got the Nobel in economics for the idea of, of just putting those basic predispositions in place, right? You just create those little incentives by how you structure things and help people choose the right thing, the sustainable or just or low impact thing, because it's a little cheaper or a little shinier or a whatever, right? Uh, I've got one. So yeah. I, have so I have solar panels. And I love getting my electric bills. <laughs> and um, they range from 36 cents to $36. And um, once we get our new windows and we don't have to use space heaters, it'll, <laughs> God knows when we'll get our new windows. Um, but, and then also I get, um, they're called SREC, but I get between yeah. 50 and $200 a quarter which I really love. So yeah. <laughs> like something like energy credits. Yeah. 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 yeah uh, it's, uh, it is. Yes, it's great. It's like a little freebie. Like I save money on my electric bill and I get SREX. Yep. Solar renewable energy credits and credits. they are good in Maryland and great in DC because in Annapolis and in the Wilson building, they have done forward thinking legislation. Yeah. Go north to Pennsylvania, where their state house has been dysfunction, and and the uh, SREX are are bubkus, right? So right. this is again creating the social structures that incentivize the good behavior that then lead people to right. They, they shift the bechira point into the realm where people who never thought of it might just go solar. So maybe the, the concept of SREX, which I never heard of before two minutes ago gets tied into uh, the health monitors that lots of people wear, the Fitbits that measure steps and health and incentivizes that as a way to um, drive less and walk more. That's nice. Social policy. Nice. Which gets me to my age old conflict, which you and I have discussed. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Well, again, that's the, the yes or hurrah is not always bad, right? People, people uh, based on how our society is structured right now, people need cars. More of them should be electric, more of them should be hybrid, fewer of them should be heavy and, and, and vroom vroom, but um, right. so. Um, There's hope. Well, yeah. and I was just thinking I get fireworks when I get to 10,000 steps and my, I had a Prius and I played that video game and now I have an all electric car and I notice when I turn the heat off, I get a lot more miles. And so I just wear gloves in my car, which is, but I guess, I guess I'm, I'm sort of struggling with how that links back to the earlier concepts of bearing the burden of and with others and whether it's just sort of, we get in the practice of doing it and suddenly find ourselves with the capacity to be more empathetic. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots and maybe I'm jumping too far ahead, but I have a lot of these small examples. This is this is a, a fun and creative conversation, but, but you're, you're I'm missing the connection others. to the bigger picture a little bit. You're helping others uh, who either don't believe that they need help, but you're helping them uh, regardless of the act by the actions you're taking. You're bearing the burden of uh, somebody who doesn't know that you're prolonging their good health or their viability on the planet. I 
it's a stretch, but I thought. No, not, not much of a stretch. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, nice. You know, grateful for this. Um, I would love to hear if, if, you know, if there are more ideas, I'm also, I'm putting um, well, basically what we covered tonight in the chat here, right? That those are the six things that, um, that we looked at as kind of frameworks from within Musar, a Musar orientation that have green impact. And I wonder, as we look back on every Mida and its opposite, choice points, heat lam dut, openness, bearing the burden, cheshbon uh, nefesh, and the yetzer. Um, if, like, did any of these not work for you? Or did any of them really speak to you? Yeah. No, I, I think, Rabbi, that for me as a dabbler, I can imagine if, if for example, you had an opportunity to come and, and give a two-part, I mean, you or someone had an opportunity to come and give a two-part series to, to people from my synagogue that really haven't been exposed to Musar. And you did this like this one night and you did like the next one, the next night, like you're talking about doing, I think it would be very clear, you know, to select those, those key, key points. Uh, I think it's a good, I think you're off to a good start and I'm looking forward to reading the essay when it comes out and, and sharing that with other people. So uh, let us know, but let me know when it's going to be coming out. Um, so yeah, um, good. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. If there are other reflections, I'd love to hear them even later. Um, Y'all have my email address. Um, from the dawn of the digital era, I still have Rabbi Fred at AOL.com. That's easy to remember. Um, so uh, like, feel free to use it. All right, very, very quickly, I just wanna show you the shiny fun ones because a lot of you have studied with some of these people and uh, seemed, seems to be appropriate to just bring it home with these last few pieces so that we can start with Midot in two weeks when we meet again on February first. So, um, oh gosh, it went back to the very beginning. So sorry here. Bah, 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 bah. Wow, that was a lot of Torah. Woo, that goes quick. All right. Um, so Musar, to heal the world. Um, I found this graphic in the Jewish Journal interviewing Rabbi Lori Shapiro, who talks about Tikkun Olam versus Tikkun Midot. Tikkun Olam is outward facing, repairing the world, calls us into the streets, Musar faces inward, spotlighting individual behaviors and their impact on family and community. And I love this summary. Musar views the perfection of our moral character as a formula to help heal the world. The Tikkun Midot, working on our own attributes, doing our own internal Musar work, in theory, if everyone did it, the world would be repaired. Um, but at least if I do what I can while I can, it's going to help. And maybe that's all that we can ask. After all, Pirkei Avot famously says, Lo alecha hamlecha ligmor. It's not upon you to complete the job. Just lo ata ben chorin lebatel mimena. You're not a child of freedom to simply walk away from it. All right. So... I put this then to David Jaffe as the first of the great modern popularizers of Musar because he wrote the book just a few years ago, Changing the World from the Inside Out, which is really activist Musar. David and I knew each other 30 years ago um, as like young progressives on campus and he got Orthodox Nicha and he's still a young progressive activist. Um, and he really straddles these worlds uniquely more than anyone I know. And he is so wise and so sensitive. And he's already done an organizing deep dive into Musar. He has not fully applied it to climate, at least in writing. Like I say, he should. He should write this essay. Since he hasn't yet, I'm going to take a stab at it. But I owe a lot of it to David. You should all take note of the inside out wisdom and action.org the Iowa project, that's his, right? Inside Out Wisdom Action. Um, really, really good stuff. So if there's one book to read 
not just as what is Musar, but what is activist Musar, start here. For what is Musar, start here. Everyday Holiness by Alan Marinus, which is really the, the key text for the last 15 years or so for so many of us going through this. And Alan and the Musar Institute have so much to offer. And then Ira, who we have all learned with, and Ira's disciples, right, out of Philadelphia initially, contemporarymusar.org, with which Martha is so identified. And now you begin to see the screen is getting crowded. <laughs> and I put these three up advisedly as the three greats today, living now, teaching now, applying Musar now. You can argue with me. But if those are the three greats, the Gedolim, who's missing? Ben Franklin. <laughs> nice. Like I said, living, but yeah. <laughs> ben Franklin, hi, hi, Bikayam, Ben Franklin. Yeah, okay, yeah. No. Um, okay. Well, here's the problem. I love all three of these guys. I have read so much. I have learned so much. But where are the women? And where's the breadth of it? So I add Nancy Fuchs Kramer from the Reconstructionist Rabin College as an example of someone who hasn't written a book, but who has brought Musar into every corner of her very influential work in the Jewish community. And I feature here <laughs> on this crazy decoupage right, page, um, on the right, the Musar Torah commentary just came out in 2020 um, through the reform movement, but with a range of voices. And as the uh, forward notes, it is the first published volume of Musar writings to feature a majority of women authors. So it's a short little take, often quoting Alan Marinus, sometimes quoting Ira, sometimes quoting David. Um, but, um, you know, it came in part out of Musar Institute, more out of the reform movement, contributions from all over. It's awesome. And it's a short little essay every week on the Parsha that opens doors and raises questions about different Midot. And um, it's beautiful as far as it goes, right? No one volume is, 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 is going to do it all. But adding to these, make sure to look at that. And anywhere that you can find the newer, the younger, and the more balanced, particularly around gender, voices have to call out IJS, Institute for Jewish Spirituality, where David Jaffe's curriculum is being taught by Mark Margolis and some other amazing teachers, um, RRC, Dr. Nancy, American Musar, Greg Marcus, Shmuley Yanklowitz in the modern Orthodox community, and, and, and. So I wanted to come back to Nancy because just about four years ago, she actually spoke at Adat Shalom on Musar and acknowledged her debt to Ira. She was in Ira's first working group that spent two years slogging through Luzzato long before um, he, you know, literally wrote the book on, on uh, Missy Lai Sharim. And she brought this into her work, training rabbis at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, convening a multi-faith effort called Cultivating Character. And as she describes it, this is natural because we have always maintained, here's two civilizations again, or more, right? That that's how we evolve and grow and that ethical living is core. For us, it's clear we engage with Jewish civilization because it makes our lives meaningful and helps us grow toward human excellence. We are here on earth to bear the burden of the other. You have to ask, you have to dig. It applies in any situation. And it's not about saving the other, but trying to understand their burden, as we said earlier, and bearing it together. That's why I'm here. That's what I hope to be about. And the affirming note that I'm ending on is that this unfolds in a multi-faith encounter. Again, there's something very particularistic about Mossad. There's also something incredibly universalistic. So she became an active practitioner and as her Jewish formation grew, so did her interfaith work evolve. 
sharing spiritual practices for the cultivation of character enhanced encounters across faith, even as they further strengthened her grounding as a Jew. We can sink deeper roots as we open wider hearts. Love that image. Sink deeper roots, go deeper in our Yiddishkeit, deeper in our Musar practice, and open wider hearts as we encounter the Baha'i Virtues Project and Muslim, Sufi, and other ethical codes and Christian and Hindu and Buddhist and secular. How did you do so skillfully? That's the growing edge of the field. So, end of part one. Ah, two weeks from now, some green-tinged midot. We'll sing and we'll call it a night. Ah, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being on the journey with me, with each other. Okay. Hope to see you again in two weeks. Hope to see you long, uh, lots of other times. Between. And, um, Keep going with your Musar. Thank you. Good night. Oh, okay. thank you for having me. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Linda. Good to see Bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>